Hi everyone. When I was 12, my parents bought me a video game called SimCity. Who here has ever played SimCity? Okay, great. For those of you who haven't, the game puts you in the position of someone who's between a mayor, who chooses where the roads, schools are going to be, and a god, which is actually the cool part because you get to set buildings on fire and trigger riots. I absolutely loved this game. The only issue with it, actually, is that I terribly sucked at it. What frustrated me is that I would spend hours and hours trying to craft the perfect, most agreeable cities. And all I got was cold treatment plants, criminals, and low tax revenues. But I like to think that I'm not alone. And in fact, I bet that most of you who have played have built the worst possible cities with the best intentions. Now, this is just a game, but there is only a small step between the game and reality. What happens in reality is that a committee of experts and politicians gather and decide where residential, commercial, industrial zones are going to be when we need schools and other amenities. Now, these people are brilliant and know cities extremely well, probably better than I do, but that's not the problem. The problem is that their decisions are based on ideas and intuitions, rarely on facts. Sometimes it works, if you take the work of Osman in Paris, for instance, but most of the time, our ideas and intuition fail us. And in fact, there is a long-standing tradition of things getting terribly wrong when people try to build cities according to their own ideas. Like in St. Louis, this is a housing project in 1954, and here's what happened to it in 1970. Like in France, La Courneuve, La Cité des 4000, this is an artistic view, and this is what happened to it in 1986. Like in China, with the ghost towns, and also in other parts of the world. And like Bruce Town, but we never built this one. So clearly, we need to replace intuition with something. Cities have been with us for a while, a very long while. But they only started thriving after the Industrial Revolution. In 1800, only 3% of the world population lived in cities. By 1950, 30% of the world population lived in urban areas. In 2008, half of the world population was urban. And this is not going to stop anytime soon. The current projections say that in 2030, 75% of the world population is going to live in cities. That's more than 6 billion people. Few of us are aware of it, but right now, we're in the midst of a silent revolution, the urban revolution, one that concerns all of us and which I believe makes understanding cities ever more important. But see, studying cities is not new. Geographers, urbanists, and even economists have been studying them for a while. But see, the funny thing is, I'm a physicist. And you're probably wondering, as I am, why should a physicist care about cities, right? Well, to answer this question, you need to know that Physics, although advertised as a theoretical science, is first and foremost an empirical science. Physicists try to understand the world through observation and experiments. In short, physics loves data. And as it turns out, the amount of data that is being gathered about cities is increasing at a fantastic pace. It comes from satellites, from mobile phones, from social media, from metro cards and census records. And all this new data opens the very exciting possibility of a new science of cities. What we're trying to do is to listen to what cities have to say in order to understand them. And we need to understand them, because it is only then that we will be able to make them better. Think about it. You wouldn't try to build rockets without understanding the principles of gravity. You wouldn't perform surgery 
unless you knew how the human body works, or would you? All empirical science's first step is to try to make sense of the world through classification. In chemistry, we have the periodic table. In biology, we try to classify all living things into species. This is why, two years ago, my PhD supervisor, Mark Bartholomew, and I tried to classify cities according to the structure of their road network. Such studies already existed, but they were very subjective. What I mean by subjective is that if you take two different people, you will obtain two different classifications. So we asked ourselves, can we remove the subjective part in these classifications? Can we let the classification emerge from data itself? Well, the idea we came up with was that the geometry of the road network is contained in the blocks. Those blocks are the pieces of a puzzle that forms the city layout. So for more than 130 cities in the world, we took those blocks and sorted them by size and shape to get what we call the fingerprint. Using very simple statistical methods, we are able to say how similar or dissimilar these fingerprints are. And doing so, we found that there were four types of cities in the world. The first category, two, contains European cities and organic layouts. Think about Paris, Rome, or even Boston in the United States. The second category, three, contains most American cities and grid layouts, New York, Los Angeles, and even Campo Grande in Brazil. Mogadishu, number four, and Buenos Aires, number one, were so different from any other cities that they each both constituted a category on their own. Now, sometimes the results were, went against intuition. Would you have guessed that the streets of the Bronx were closest to the streets of Porto in Portugal? Would you have guessed that the streets of Staten Island were the closest to those of Asueda in Syria? This, we believe, suggests that cities grow according to different processes, different algorithms. And what we are trying to do now is to understand what these processes are. Classifying things is always the first step towards understanding them. Here's a completely different example of how science might help us understand cities. We all know here that human activities increase the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which in turn is responsible for climate change. In the United States, 30% of these emissions are due to cars and trucks. What we wanted to know was the role that cities played in these emissions. So we took data gathered by the Vulcan project and looked at the correlations between the total emissions in cities and their population. What we found, it's on this curve, is that when you double the population of a city, you multiply the emissions not by two, but by 2.58. This represents a 29% increase per capita. This is not so good. <laughs> so we wanted to know why. And the why, as it turns out, is a one-word answer. Congestion. Imagine a situation where all workers go to work in the same area in a city. As the number of workers increases, there's going to be more and more congestion, and the center is going to be less and less attractive. Think about it. More traffic jams, the more you want to move out. Whoever's been in Los Angeles understands what I mean. <laughs> what we found is that people do move out. Congestion pushes cities to create new centers. But we also found that the centers don't appear soon enough to absorb all the congestion. As a result, the traffic keeps increasing. More traffic jams equals more car emissions equals more CO2. We understood two things during this study. The first one is cities naturally evolve to be like this. 
So if we don't make a conscious effort to change it, it won't change. The second thing is, if we keep depending on our cars, the problem is not going to be solved anytime soon. The next research project I want to talk to you about is probably the most poignant. Segregation is something we don't like to talk about much, but it exists. Sociologists have been talking about segregation for a long while, and they came up with a series of very interesting measures that allow us to calculate segregation at the city level, to say how segregated the city is. This allows you to compare cities to one another and understand where the biggest challenges are, where you should concentrate your efforts at a federal level. The issue with these measures is that inside cities, they don't tell you which neighborhoods are segregated and those which are not. So we looked into income segregation in the United States and look at what previous measurements give for Austin in Texas, single member. Now, if you apply our measurement at the neighborhood level, here's what we find. See, now you can tell which neighborhoods are the most segregated. The next question we asked is, why are some neighborhoods segregated and not the other ones? Is it because we have an unusual concentration of the lower incomes or the higher incomes? And here's part of the answer. In yellow, you see the regions where high incomes gather in the city. And now you might see a pattern, which is that the neighborhoods that are the most segregated are also the ones where higher incomes gather. Okay, that's an intuition. So to confirm this intuition, we need to go a little bit further. And for that, imagine a world in which we have unlimited funds, unlimited power, and we can relocate individuals to create a non-segregated city. The first question you can ask is, what is the proportion of individuals that you will need to move to create this non-segregated city? And here's the answer. For lower income, 12% of individuals will need to move. 18% of the middle income individuals will need to move. And a startling 47% of the higher incomes will have to move. Now we can ask a second question, which is slightly different, which is how far on average would people have to move in order to create a non-segregated city? And here's the answer. Lower and middle incomes would have to move roughly by one kilometer, which is just a couple of blocks away. Higher incomes on the other end would have to move an average over the entire United States of 22 kilometer. So now I think the situation is clear. I think the highest income don't want to live with the rest of us. <laughs> now, you might think that income segregation is not such a big deal. But what if I told you that we can apply the exact same measures to racial segregation? I don't think we're going to like what we find out, but we're going to find out. The physicist in me loves to understand why. And as you must have gathered now, cities are almost uncharted why territory. Every satellite view you see, every statistic you read, and every step you take in a city elicits a question that is yet to be answered. You, I, and half of the planet steps every day on one of the most fascinating puzzles that humans ever built. Now, the next time you step in a city, I invite you to imagine what could, will be possible, how different the world could be like if you understood them just a little bit better. Imagine what could happen if we could transform good intentions into policies that actually work. My goal in studying cities is to make you win SimCity, but in real life. Thank you.